Hello, my name is Susan Banke, and I'm here to give you a talk on Myanmar. I'd like to thank the Sydney Southeast Asia Center for the opportunity to do so here at the Politics in Action conference uh, in a very different format and context than we've ever seen before. With that, I think I'm just going to jump in. I think we are looking for good news right now. We are in a moment where the world seems to have shifted massively, and uh, we all want just that, that little good news story to make us feel like we're not quite unmoored. Alas, I am here to talk to you about Myanmar, and as such, I don't have that much good news to deliver. <clears throat> My message for this talk is that while we may be on the precipice of vast changes in the global order, at this moment, the story of Myanmar is the story of intransigence and inertia. Yes, there has been some reform in the periphery and even in the center, to use a, a term plied by Myanmar scholars quite regularly, but the underlying patterns that dictate how the country is governed and how the people of Myanmar experience life are following similar waves that the country has witnessed many times before. The scale and scope of pockets of openness and the targets of oppression may have altered, but the underlying patterns of power assertion remain the same. I'm going to focus on three themes to point to here in this moment in time. These reveal that the patterns that this country, these are patterns that the country has seen before. The ones that I'm going to look at are governance, the particular case of the Rohingya, and generalized civil war and ethnic strife. So first, governance. The two parties with any say in Myanmar remain rusted and slow to develop power. These are the military or former military machinery of the USDP and the ruling power, the National League for Democracy, the NLD, which was, it must be remembered, formerly the outlawed opposition party with Aung San Suu Kyi, the Nobel laureate at its helm. Now, on top of the NLD's agenda has been efforts to push through constitutional reform, which could structurally change the power dynamics in Myanmar. It could change the power equation in Myanmar's leadership. For example, a change to the constitutionally mandated 25% of the military allocated seats in parliament might signal change. But as Mon Mon Myat writes, the discipline of the military promises that, at least until now, not one of those 25% of military would vote to amend the Constitution to remove this allocation. And since the Constitution requires a 75% majority to push through amendments, this promises to be a stalemate topic for many years to come. And you can see here that I've included a slide to show in early March a sitting of Parliament where the military are all wearing face masks. It looks to me that they certainly had far more discipline than we here in Australia did. No one was wearing face masks as early as early March. In fact, these discussions about constitutional reform are a bit of a red herring. They're a bit of a distractor from substantive issues. To date, the only three constitutional amendments that have passed have merely dispensed with extraneous language so far in the Constitution and some minor points of clarification. This reinforces what Melissa Crouch has asserted, which is that constitutional reform has become a form of political capital, and everyone wants credit for working on it. So the exercise has become one of jockeying for credit, not one for actually pushing through necessary change. Now, you may ask, how can a government machinery be so rusty if it's the NLD in power, which was an opposition party until 2015? Until then, it was defined by its op opposition to the authoritarian state. And there are many answers to this question. Most fall somewhere along the spectrum of willingness. That is, on the one hand, Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD have been forced are co-opted into submission by a frightening military that has kind of strong-armed them. On the other, we see the argument that the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi have bought wholesale into a narrative that their primary goal is the restoration of order in Myanmar. 
I tend to lean toward the assertions of Kinzel Wynn, who is a former political prisoner and currently a policy advocate, who has called Myanmar a dual state, where the military and civilian leadership are practicing a kind of twin authoritarianism. Those are his words. It's a devil's deal of sorts between former opposition, former military, and remaining military power holders. In September 2019, Kinzel Wynn wrote, we are staring at the fact that older generations are failed generations. As Myanmar moves into the closing years of the NLD's term of office, the two leaders, Aung San Suu Kyi and Min Aung Kliang, share the unenviable distinction of having together pushed the country further downhill. And here you'll see this slide, which shows General Min Aung Kliang, who is the commander in chief of the military, side by side with Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, the central question in governance right now is Myanmar's upcoming elections expected to be held in November 2020. So will this change the power balance is the big question. The Myanmar scholar Nini Jha points out that of the challengers to the NLD right now, the USDP, the former uh, ruling party, the ethnic minority parties who used to mostly be aligned with the NLD and are now going their own way, and what Nini Jha calls new parties established by veterans of the system either on one side or on the other, really only the ethnic minority parties have the potential to tip the balance away from the NLD. This is because, as Nini Jha points out, ethnic minority parties that, parties that previously ran against one another have now coalesced in some places to form more strong parties. That would be um, in Karen State, Kachin, Mon, Kareni, and Chin States offering potentially a more serious challenge to the NLD. Now, while new parties may not offer much of a serious challenge, I'd counsel you to keep your eyes out for two that may come from very different angles, who come from very different angles, who at the very least have the possibility to inject new questions into the elections and destabilize political outcomes. So first, there's Tura Shui Man, former general who fell out of favor with the USDP in 2015 and developed an uneasy alliance at the time with Aung San Suu Kyi. He is reportedly the most hated person in Myanmar today, according to hardliners after Aung San Suu Kyi. He has started his own party, the UBP, the Union Betterment Party. On the other side, we have Ugo Goji, a former political prisoner who lost as an NLD candidate in 2015 and has now started the People's Party. Now, in the slide that you should be seeing right now, you can see the cutoff headline, but what it is trying to say in the party of Ugo Goji is that the party is seeking to make alliances with ethnic parties, and this would be an example of some destabilizing influences in terms of the elections. Now, you may ask how COVID-19 will affect the elections. Nicholas Ferry and Chit Wynn have pointed out that the contraction of the economy, a certainty given the demise of the Chinese economy, has the potential to wreak havoc on predicted election outcomes as it will signal a decline in the economy in Myanmar. That is, the 33 agreements signed between Myanmar and China in January 2020, at the time considered a boon for the current current government, much fanfare attached to that, now may fail to materialize. And as well, we can imagine that foreign assistance will taper off because of COVID-19, including robust programs on electoral reform that kept a close watch on Myanmar and helped support the chances for fair and free elections. So one can imagine some backsliding on that regard. I now turn to my second element, which is Rohingya violence and the political response. Now, no matter how disinterested you are in Myanmar, you will have seen the headlines in the media across the world about the 2017, earlier as well, but mainly 2017 atrocities or clearance operations, as they're known within the country, committed by the Myanmar military on this minority Muslim group in Myanmar. Now, these attacks remain political today for a few reasons. The first is that an estimated 750,000 Rohingya fled in 2017, joining about 350,000 that were already there. So the one million refugee population in Cox's Bajar, Bazar region of Bangladesh has maintained a humanitarian focus on a region that already 
had less resources, environmental risks, and severe overcrowding. A few weeks ago, the first case of COVID was announced in Cox's Bazaar, and it remains a terrifying reality what COVID-19 could wreak on this already vulnerable population. And a slide that you will see here shows how this has garnered some attention globally. The vulnerability of the population has gained even greater global attention now that boats of Rohingya are stranded at sea because no one wants to take the passengers. That includes back in Myanmar, in Bangladesh, and also in Malaysia. Second, a rare international mechanism was deployed in support of the Rohingya in to November 2019 with some important political ramifications. The Republic of the Gambia filed suit against Myanmar in the International Court of Justice for violating the Genocide Convention. The ICJ, which is the UN's highest court, carries heavy international weight <clears throat> and its provisional orders in January 2020 that Myanmar take measures to prevent further mass killings demonstrates without any doubt that the country has fallen from any kind of political reform grace that may have had in the past. Now, related is the third reason that the Rohingya remain a political element in Myanmar today, Aung San Suu Kyi's role in abandoning them. Aung San Suu Kyi had already been massively discredited globally for not taking a more vocal stand to protect the rights of the Rohingya. She was, in fact, stripped of many international prizes, although not the Nobel. <clears throat> but her public defense of Myanmar at the ICJ in late 2019 in The Hague had two contrasting effects. First, it sealed the deal on many international diplomats who had begun to lose hope in her. As Farrelly and Wynne noted, behind closed doors, when the diplomatic niceties, niceties are put away, there is ill-disguised disgust for Myanmar's senior decision makers and their callousness toward the Rohingya. Harsh words indeed. But the second effect is that Aung San Suu Kyi gained in popularity inside the country. The abhorrence against the Rohingya among many in the population is so strong that Aung San Suu Kyi's sidestepping of their rights and her refusal to admit Myanmar's faults has earned her great admiration, including pro-Suu Kyi protests across major towns in Myanmar and similar demonstrations in other countries as well, including Australia Parliament House in Canberra. Demonstrations were organized under the slogan of We Stand with Dosu. The third element that I want to mention is returning, continuing, and emerging civil wars in the country. So the numerous ethnic groups remain in various forms of contestation against the central state. And I want to point out a few hot spots to you. These are certainly not comprehensive, but you will see these on the map on the slide. Karen State, which is number one on the map, the ethnic Karen have various militias that have been fighting the government and among themselves since the birth of Myanmar as a country. The ceasefire signed in 2012 by the Karen National Union has barely held. There is now renewed fighting. Kachin State, number two on the map, the ethnic Kachin had a 17-year ceasefire signed, but in 2011, just as there was turbulent transition, again in the words of uh, Farrelly and Wynne, the turbulent transition was commencing, the Kachin ceasefire broke down. Number three on the map is Rakhine State. Now, the Arakan army in Rakhine State, although it was originally funded and started up in Kachin State, but it has grown to a force of between 7,000 and 10,000 in just 10 years. It was founded 10 years ago. Working to call back the arms of the central state, the Arakan army has been attacking government posts and represents the most violent exchanges with the Tatmada in recent years. In the past month, the Arakan army has officially been labeled as a terrorist group by the government. On their side, the Arakan army have publicly asserted the importance of their role in overseeing elections in Rakhine State. Nini Jaw points out that these efforts by the Arakan army to interfere in elections might open the door to other ethnic groups doing similar, which could be an ominous trend for democratic processes. Finally, Shan State, which is number four on the map, Shan State continues to be rocked by a legacy of illicit drug production, internal displacement, 
vying power mongers from the USWA, the United States WA Army, and the military, and challenges to livelihoods that come from land loss, and to quote Kevin Woods, a geography of debt and dispossession. We can identify in these ethnic groups, as well as in many others, a few themes. The central government continues to clash with ethnic minority groups over questions of representation and autonomy. The dawn of whatever governance you might call in Myanmar today has not solved that problem. Efforts at peace talks have largely stalled as both ceasefire and non-ceasefire groups grow increasingly wary of the state and the military. Land and resource grabs are a consistent part of the political economy of unequal power relations in Myanmar. <clears throat> the tensions here are not simply between the central state and minority ethnic groups, but between elites in every ethnic group and the non-elites. Kevin Woods has looked at the relationship between the military state, business interests, local elites, and the capital and markets that empower them in Myanmar, and found these to be true. The struggle for recognition and resources means many parts of Myanmar remain in tension and conflict, such that there is a significant internally displaced population, as well as those externally displaced, both in Bangladesh and still in Thailand. So these displaced internally, estimated at 350,000 in Rakhine, Shan, Chin, Karen, and Kachin states, have a set of humanitarian concerns that are particularly pressing in the context, of course, of COVID-19. The other entirely unresolved issue with the internally displaced is the conditions under which they may potentially ever return. Lands have been taken away. Traditional systems have been destroyed. It is completely unclear how these populations will be able to reintegrate. And this, of course, has consequences on any future peace. Finally, I'd call to mind call to your attention a 2019 monograph by David Brenner, which, is offering, which offered a fine-grained analysis of the diverging trajectories of the Karen and the Kachin. He identifies phases that will sound familiar to Myanmar watchers and that are also relevant to other pockets of insurgency in Myanmar and potentially elsewhere. First, uh, compromised leadership from the elite in each of these ethnic groups then increasing internal fragmentation, and then further resistance. Now, the factors that determine when these phases play out straddle three layers of the rebel social network identified by Brenner. Current leaders, those who are eager to get a piece of the elite pie, what Brenner calls aspirant, aspirant elites and grassroots actors. So the takeaway from Brenner's book brings me back to my original point. While there may be some variety in when stages of oppression and division and reaction occur, we seem to be seeing the same cycles again and again. So having examined governance, the issue of the Rohingya, and ethnic politics today, I therefore, therefore circle back to my initial claim. In the political realm, it's clear that little has changed for the Myanmaris. And I conclude with the Burmese proverb, Gwe mi gao ji dao su. The kinked tail of a dog remains kinked, even when you pull it out of a bamboo pole. So with that not exceptionally positive conclusion, I at least leave you with an adorable picture of a dog with a kinked tail. And I'm happy to take any questions in the Q&A. My information is on the very last slide. Thank you so much.